my work uh, very much focuses on uh, the environment. So I'm very interested in bacterial communities primarily. And I've been interested in drug resistance for probably about 25 years. So currently, there's an enormous amount of concern about the level of resistance and the prevalence of it in microbial pathogens, but specifically pathogens that are common in hospitals, that pathogens that colonize our guts. And if these organisms become very resistant to all the antibiotics that we have available to treat them, then no longer will there be any operations. There'll be only the kind of operations where people's lives are in danger, for example, from an accident. So um, there, there is a lot of discussion about it, but it really is a major hazard um, for health in the community. So I'm going to tell you about the resilience of the community to the invasion of resistance genes. And um, I'm going to consider the environment. So I'll say a little bit about your microbiomes as well. So we need to think about the complexity of all the linking components <coughs> where bacteria are present. Bacteria are everywhere. So they're all over you, they're inside you, and they're, um, they're in uh, animals, they're in the food chain, and they are responding to various selection impacts. So we've heard about climate, we've heard about pollution, we've heard about um, geographical impacts that might affect communities. So Obviously, bacteria are exposed to drugs continuously. This could be anywhere. It could be in your gut, it could be in the hospital, certainly in the farming environment and in the food chain. We use antibiotics to preserve foods. Uh, heavy metals are contaminants in the environment. They occur naturally as well as from pollution from industry. And the tendency is that bacteria respond to these kind of threats by acquiring genes. And those genes allow them to adapt to the presence of hazards. And those hazards, for example, could be mercury. So you could have mercury, and then they acquire a gene which allows them to pump mercury out of their cells. So bacteria are incredibly adaptive. They adapt continuously. They're always evolving. They never stop still. So that's why we haven't beaten them in terms of killing them with antibiotics, because they're always getting resistance to adapt to more hazards. And what we need to think about is really how bacteria can acquire all these genes and whether those genes ever, do they ever disappear from the community? Do they cause fitness impacts? What um, implications do they have for long-term um, maintenance of, of these mobile genes? So you have to think about it as a very fluid environment with a big pool of genes moving around between bacteria. So <coughs> If we think about resilience in microbial communities, it's kind of um, a, a complicated issue because you imagine this, it's like a marshmallow, really. It's continuously changing. You prod it, and it makes a dip, and then it kind of reforms. So it's very hard to imagine that there's going to be significant impacts because of adaptation. So if we think about the impacts here, we can imagine some effects. We can imagine, for example, climate change, increase in carbon dioxide, increase in acidity in the seas. That can impact, there's a clear impacts there on, on higher organisms. How do, how do microbes respond? Well, they, microbes in, uh, ha carry out very important functions in the environment. And if you prevent some of those functions, then there will be a, a really a major impact on the ecosystem. However, because of their resilience, they're able to adapt. 
And I think this is the real story I want to convey, is the adaptiveness of microbial communities. And there's a lot of data which shows that uh, bacterial communities change with hazards, with exposure to impacts. They may return to the original composition, but generally they don't. And what happens is that they acquire new genes and greater ability to adapt to further change. So the more you prod them, the more they evolve and adapt and change. And so that, and there have been quite a few studies about climate change, but very little consideration about drug resistance and the impacts of drug resistant genes on communities. So the questions then we want to pose are, the, are the communities resistant to change? Well, I've already sort of said probably uh, they're not. They probably will change. And are they resilient? Will they be able to carry out the same functionality? Maybe, maybe there will be some changes. And are they functionally resilient? Well, I, I'm pretty sure that there's sufficient redundancy in many microbial communities. By that I mean a lot of diversity of doing similar things in quite different ways. That bacteria are very resilient. Which is why they're fun to work with, but of course their implications. And this is a nice example of an impact, which I think is salutary because it, it's very close to home. It's in uh, our microbiome and it's the salivary microbiome. So in your mouth, you've got loads of bacteria, and those bacteria are pretty constant composition. So if you're ill, they might change a bit, but generally when you get better, they'll come back to the norm. And you can pretty much detail the residency of that community, and it will be a constant for the greater part of your life. In your guts, um, and this is determined usually by your feces because gut biopsy is a pretty invasive and unpleasant experience. So we tend to look at gut microbiomes using feces. And the gut microbiome actually is quite sensitive because it's in a very defined environment and that environment is constant. So that's actually an exception for a microbial community to have an environment where it's very constant and very little change is occurring. So if there is a dramatic change, for example, you take an antibiotic, that will have a severe impact on your gut microflora. And what is shown here in the top two graphs, in these two graphs here, the top two, you can see the impacts of various antibiotics being given to patients. And all the different colors are different time scales for the measurement of the microbial community. And what, what I would simply say here is that the tighter the ball of, of dots is, the more resilient the community. So if you look here, you can see that you've got, in the salivary microbiome, two very tight balls, really. So you see a little bit of movement out, so that's difference, that's change. But by the end, by the blue, the blue uh, colors, they're all back sort of in the central position, which is showing similarity. So it's, that's resilience to the impact of these antibiotics. There's a different story in the fecal microbiome because it's scattered, and you can see the scatter. Uh, this is two different antibiotics. This one is having much greater impact. This is clindamycin and cipromycin. So certain antibiotics have a more dramatic impact on your gut than others. And often it's manifest, you'll get diarrhea, you'll have stomach cramps, something like that. But in the long term, so over a 12 month period, you can see there's still blue outliers here and here. So that's that shows that there isn't always resilience and that we should be concerned about our gut flora. However, what happened here in this study was that many of these bacteria, particularly these, were replaced by bacteria that were resistant. So things like Clostridium difficile. 
if you start taking a lot of antibiotics, you might tend to get a more increased presence of certain bacteria which, which are more resistant and they have maybe other genes or there'll be other bacteria which have different resistance genes. So they respond very quickly. So you can have an impact and it can affect you. Your gut flora is critical to your health and well-being. So it's a very important thing to maintain it and it will affect every aspect of your, of your life. The environment is more complex. We use antibiotics to keep animals healthy. We don't use them for growth promotion. However, a lot of antibiotic is given to animals that are reared intensively. So there is a correspondence between intensive agriculture, cramped conditions, poor animal health and welfare, and the use of antibiotics humans living in poor conditions suffer more infections. So you can see the corollary there. This is an example of a study we did. And I'm just going to show you some little short case histories of some studies where we looked at pig manure being added to land. The pigs have been fed on a macrolide called tylosin. So it tends to confer resistance in the, in the gut microbiome of the pig all its bacteria must be resistant to tylosin. Tylosin's a little bit like erythromycin, so it's, it's a big macrolide, and some of the genes are, are the same. It's the same kind of pump mechanism to be resistant. We also looked at two other uh, resistances. So the slurry was kept in slurry tanks, and it was spiked with two other drugs, oxytetracycline, which is again used in agriculture, and the sulfonamide, which I'm just going to call SCP, and that's used a lot to control infections in pigs and sometimes in chickens. So that was added to the land, and then we monitored what happened over a two-year period. And so what you can see there is that the blue line is the original pig slurry, which has very high level. Obviously, it's Express the resistance is expressed against the pig slurry, which is where everything is resistant to the drugs in question. So these are the uh, three drugs. I've just got the data here for the sulfonamide because this is the one we were, uh, we've got data for the whole lot, but this is the one that we were interested in. And you can see that in fact, uh, with uh, concentration, so this axis here, the <clears throat> y-axis shows you the resistance um, against a quotient, 100%, with, with level of increasing concentration. So when we're up at this level, between 50 and 100 micrograms per mil, it, they're very, very resistant. Okay, so uh, you can see that even up to a year, there's, there's pink showing here, and there's some... Uh, activity here. So the pink is over a year. So they were very resistant bacteria. So we showed in this study that the enteric bacteria of the pigs survived. There was transfer to the indigenous population in the soil and there was high resistance even up to one year. And the same kind of effect went on in the following year. And this simply shows you a mobile element where you can see that we've got a soil bacterium and it's actually acquired all sorts of interesting genes. It's got a gene from a carini bacterium, it's got a gene from E. coli and a gene from Salmonella. And we know that because by looking at the sequence similarities of those genes, we can see where they've come from. So that's a real hybrid mobile element, and that's gone into the Arthrobacter. Probably it has some adaptive value, maybe because it carries a pump here, and that pump gives it biocide resistance, so it makes it resistant to disinfection and disinfectants and other chemicals that might be in the environment. We don't always know why a mobile element is acquired, and it may be just evolution. So. These mobile elements, these are called integrons, 
And they're very prevalent where there's a lot of resistance. And they tend to be like a, a necklace of pearls collecting little cassette genes, which are like the pearls on a string. And you can see that some integrons carry maybe up to 15 different drug resistance genes. And once you get an integron with all those resistances, that can just jump. Literally, it takes 20 seconds to transfer from one bacterium to another. And once that's embedded in the genome, that bacterium is resistant to those 15 or 20 different antibiotics. So you can see this is a big problem. And these genes are moving. And you can see here that in a nice bit of the Cotswolds farmland, where they've never used sewage sludge, they've not used animal manure, and things have been very um, left pristine, there's no background. Whereas where we've got pig slurry or sewage cake or a reed bed, which is from a textile mill where there's a lot of quacks, then you have high prevalence. So there's a correlation between hazard and gene and the influx and maintenance of the genes. And so this is a, a summary of these elements. And this is the way bacteria adapt and evolve. So we would say that genes coming into populations are very helpful and beneficial for bacteria to survive the hazard, making the bacteria resilient, but not making the community resistant to the incoming genes. They, they use the genes as part of their evolution. And one other source of genes is from wastewater treatment plants, because we have in our guts, a lot of us, resistant bacteria from taking antibiotics, from consuming um, food that contains resistant bacteria. Generally, there's a heightened level of resistance in the population generally. And you can see here upstream and downstream of an effluent coming from a wastewater treatment plant, there are significant differences in the level of resistant coliforms in the sediment of that river. So that was a river right next to the university. And we've correlated that resistance with the possession of plasmids. So downstream, the darker bars, you can see you've got higher level of plasmids which carry these resistant genes. So there were a lot of resistant E. coli which come from feces which would be in the sewage treatment plant and they're carrying resistant genes and they're carrying those genes on plasmids. So those plasmids are moving around. And this is an example. These are all the different plasmid types. And then you can see this is a gene in green which gives you, uh, sorry, it's in red, this one here, this gene, gives you resistance to cefotaxin, which is a third generation cephalosporin. So um, we also proved that there was dissemination of those uh, genes into eremonads and other indigenous bacteria in the river. So like the Arthrobacter example, the genes are moving out of the pathogens and the, um, the enterics and moving into the indigenous bacteria, which were downstream. So and th this is just, I'm run out of time now. So this is just to give you a little bit of an example of transferability. Many more plasmids downstream, a lot more transferable of different traits. And plasmids improve. Something I've learned only recently is plasmids dramatically impact the minute they get into their host. So a plasmid is like an integron. It's a mobile element. It moves around independent of the host chromosome. And it makes the host fitter. So it's a selfish bit of DNA. As soon as it gets into that host, it starts causing changes on the host genome that improves the genome's fitness. And that offsets the impact of carrying that plasmid. So this is really interesting, impactful information about how we've, we're going to have to deal with drug resistance. And I'll have to stop there. So just to give you the bad news, <laughs> microbial resistant, the uh, community's resistant, I'm afraid not. They're not at all resistant to change. They love it. 
Uh, resilient to change? No. They take it on board and deal with it. And they're definitely not resilient to incoming genes. That's part and parcel of how they evolve. And just to thank my collaborators and funding agencies. Sorry, that was very rushed. Thank you. Thank you very much.